what's up? It's your host, Rory, and who is ready to be petty? Welcome back to another episode of RTBP. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm back with a very special guest. Holden is here. Holden, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing really well. Welcome back. This is your second episode of RTBP, and um, I'm really glad that I get to chat with you today. Thank you so much for having me back. I had the best time on the first episode that I did. <laughs> I'm really glad. Really glad. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your TikTok? Yes. So I post a lot on TikTok, mostly just pop culture content. Um, not just what's happening in the news, but pop culture things that I really enjoy from the past, specifically like Glee. <laughs> early 2010s tv shows stuff of that nature so it's kind of a mix of all things pop culture old and new i love that and last time you were on which was episode 155 which i'll put in the show notes we talked about emma and wool model because there was rumors that they were breaking up at the time where they had recently just broken up mm -hmm. and she said which she still hasn't like super super confirmed but she like a might have a new boyfriend. B that in twenty twenty four she's gonna maybe date someone that can like write good lyrics. And I was like, ooh, that is like a little spicy. Yeah, I was a big fan of role models before they were dating, and I personally feel like his music kind of went downhill. And I'm not saying it's correlated in any way, shape, or form, but it kind of showed a lot in his lyrics. They just seemed less inspired when he was with Emma, which I would feel is weird because typically it's the other way around. But I think his older songs were more painful, I guess, for him to write. And since yeah. he was in a good place with Emma, I think it came off. This is really harsh, but maybe cheesier because. Mm -hmm. And I, I think after they broke up and again, no one really knows why neither of them have commented on it, but it seems like that was a little bit of a jab on Emma's part in her podcast when she said that. Yeah, totally. I think that is true, though, for a lot of artists. Like, I think that, uh, you know, just a lot of great art comes from, like, pain and, mm -hmm. like, trauma and stuff like that. So I feel like when you're, like, thriving, it's like, uh, I don't know, maybe you just can't pull from anything, um, I don't know, so personal. But, yeah, super interesting. I'm surprised that... They haven't said anything specific because they were kind of putting their relationship a little bit more public. So mm -hmm. not that they owe us anything, but yeah, I'm curious to to hear why. Yeah. And Emma just kind of alludes to it in her podcast sometimes yeah. where she'll mention her being single or going through a breakup. And, and she had been speculated to have been dating Ethan Dolan before. I know we talked about that on the last episode. Um, but it's kind of unclear if she's referring to like that breakup or the other guy, I think his name was Aaron. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The like um, random college. Yeah. Student. The random guy <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> or with role model, but she kind of just uh, has been alluding more frequently in her more recent episodes about it. So I kind of assume it's because of role model, but who knows? Mm -hmm, totally. Yeah. I wonder if we'll see, because I didn't really follow him before, but I'm curious to see um, when his next uh, stuff comes out. Mm -hmm, me too. If it, yeah. If it, there's any Emma references. Mm -hmm. We also talked about Taylor and Travis still going strong. There is so much content like uh, yeah. last week, which like we're recording this on a Monday. So technically yesterday but when you're listening to this it was last week's game and lots of Jason and Kylie and Taylor content and I feel like I don't know it is kind of nice to have something to look forward to <laughs> on Sundays like no Sunday scaries if you mm -hmm. can um, follow some of the the Travis did we ever settle on a portmanteau for Taylor and Travis I don't know specifically. It, I, it's different on any outlet that you look at. Tavis, <laughs> Travis. I mean, it, traveler. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's different no matter where you look. So, uh, okay. I feel like we should get into today's topic. So, we're going to talk about Jacob Elordi. Uh, he was just on SNL, and then there was like some breakup rumors with him and his girlfriend. We're going to talk about Kim Kardashian becoming 
Balenciaga's new ambassador, Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. It's like part one and two of the reunion are out, uh, but we're waiting for part three. And then we're going to talk about Hannah Burner's Netflix special. And then Holden is going to nominate a Pettyweight Champion of the Week and share his This Week in Petty. So Jacob Elordi was the host of SNL this week. Did you watch the episode? I didn't watch it in its entirety. I watched, I would say, maybe three of the skits and then both of Renee's performances. Nice. First off, I watched the show live. Um, mm-hmm. Like, Well, it was like, yeah, 8.30 Pacific time, whatever that, 11.30 Eastern. And I watched it live. I did not know it was an hour and a half. For some reason, I thought it was like a tight 30, which sounds dumb now when you realize that the guest <laughs> performs twice and there's the monologue but I was like okay like this is going to be like a fun like breezy thing to do with my family my my parents are big SNL fans and then it was like just like super dragging out like on because mm-hmm. SNL I want to say like it's not my type of comedy there's definitely sketches that are like so funny that I'll re-watch or like yep. like stuff like that but you know, it's just like, I feel like I laugh like maybe like 20% of the time. Mm. <laughs> and he was really, really nervous. I felt like in his monologue, I think he felt comfortable doing the sketches. I feel like in his monologue, he was like really nervy. Yep. But I felt like all of the sketches revolved around him being hot and tall and literally nothing else. Like, not like, no there was like one salt burn reference like yeah i don't even know if there was a priscilla reference like i was like let's talk about i don't know like there's so much content that i felt like was really left on the the table yeah and i don't know my favorite skit was the lip reading skit with jacob bowen yang and then they brought in renee rapp and that was the only skit i felt like where they didn't play into his most basic stereotype i guess um of being the tall guy the hot guy all of that stuff and you're so right with the misreferences because they didn't really reference Priscilla and honestly at this point Euphoria is just such low-hanging fruit that like they could have really done something with that and I don't know only one Saltburn reference when everyone on when he's been doing the late night circuit has been making him smell that candle (laughs) they could have used that too so I don't know I think it there were some missed opportunities but SNL I agree is it's not my type of comedy as much either um there's a few skits that I'll go back and watch but I think recently they've done a good job of trying to Gen Zify it by putting on groups of people that are very appealing to the younger generation. I first noticed it like towards the tail end of last year, especially with Timothy Chalamet and Boy Genius. Definitely, yes. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's a really good point because they did the Cat Williams sketch. I don't know if you saw that. And then they had the lip reading with like the Entertainment Tonight people and like the Golden Globes references and stuff like that. Like I definitely think that they are trying to bring in like a younger group and they have just like, you know, new talent Mm -hmm. that are also like younger and stuff like that. So, but I, the hard sell is always that it's been like on Saturday nights. Like, (laughs) like, like hopefully you're out and about, like you're not like (laughs) like, (laughs) strapping in to watch SNL. Um, There was also a big surprise because Rachel McAdams was there to introduce Renee Rapp. And then she was, in a sketch which i think is huge because we've seen with the mean girls uh press like circuit we've seen uh lindsay lohan and amanda seyfried the actor that plays damien i can't remember his name oh yeah i don't think i know his name off the top of my head yeah so we've seen these other the 2004 cast kind of celebrate the new iteration of Mean Girls so it was really nice because I kind of thought I was like she's like too good (laughs) yeah but she was too good for the Walmart commercial (laughs) and then too good for the red carpet but she like showed up for SNL I feel like it's so hard because there are such heavy hitters in that original cast and the three of them came together to do the Walmart commercial Lacey Chabert, Amanda Seyfried, and Lindsay Lohan and it was weird that Rachel McAdams didn't do it. And her answer for it was pretty telling. 
it she just simply didn't want to. Yeah, yeah, yes. Which is like fair enough because Yeah. It is like I don't know, I don't know. I feel like you would want like I don't know, a better commercial or whatever than like Walmart. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't but know. If you're like talk- an A-list. Yeah. Uh, it's just so hard because I wanted to see all four of them back and I was so glad to see Lindsay Lohan do the red carpet for the movie because I don't know if she just was the it girl back at that time she was doing everything and just seeing her back on a red carpet for a project that she's been so outspoken about being proud of um, and being honored there I think was a big step for her especially yeah. now in 2024 when she's kind of starting to make her acting comeback. Yeah, because her uh, new Netflix movie, Irish Wish, I think comes out in uh, March, like around yep. St. Patrick's Day or whatever. So yeah, I, I totally agree because she also, in so many interviews over the past you know, 20 years or whatever, has said, like, I would love to do a sequel. I would love yep. to, like, revisit this character and stuff. So, yeah, I totally agree that, yeah, I appreciate her, like, I appreciate all of them showing their support for mm-hmm. that movie. Because it is so, it is still so zeitgeisty and stuff like yes. that. Yeah, it's still quoted every week, honestly. I see stuff on Twitter about Mean Girls all the time, with Me or without too. this movie coming out in January, so... Me too, me too. And then our little host, Jacob, like all week he had rumors that he were was broken up with uh, Olivia Jade, who is Lori Lachlan's daughter of the college admissions scandal. They've been dating on and off since December 2021. And Us Weekly, which I feel like is usually like decently reliable, had posted yeah. that they had broken up. And then TMZ was like, no, they're still dating. And then like a bunch of, there was like several that said broken up, several that said still together, which I was like confused at how such like different information got, I don't know, sent out or like discovered mm-hmm. or or talked about by these news outlets. Um, but I felt in my heart of hearts, I knew that they didn't break up. <laughs> yeah, I was... It was hard because it started coming out the week he was doing SNL. So in my head, I Mm. said to myself, no matter what happens in this week, we'll know on Saturday. Because even though they don't do a lot of stuff together, um, red carpet wise, a lot of their pictures are paparazzi photos. And a lot of the hints are kind of dropped in her vlog that they are Mm -hmm. together. Um, But I was just kind of waiting to see if she was going to be seen in the audience at SNL, if she was going to be at the after party and she did end up going to the after party, which I think confirmed it for everyone that they were not broken off. Totally. Yeah. And she looked really good. She was wearing this like fur coat, high boots, like cute hair. And I'm stoked for her. Like, okay. So like, I'm not like a huge fan. I don't really know her much Mm -hmm. out, like outside of the college admission scandal, but like, her YouTube videos, like, she is the perfect person to, like, vlog and stuff. Like, it is one of those things where, like, you can put it on while you're, like, watching TV or, like, doing the dishes or whatever. And it's just, like, a comfort, like, you know, if you miss a few minutes, like, while you're flipping your laundry, like, it's, like, not the end of the world or whatever. Yeah. Like, I need a lot of that uh, kind of content in my life. (laughs) I feel like she's so good at it, too, because she kind of is she comes from a recognizable family because of the full house of it all. And so it's Laurie's kind of a household name in that sense. And Olivia Jade kind of created this lane on YouTube and came up at a time where this lifestyle blogging became really popular. And she was coming up with like Summer McKean, Emma Chamberlain, Hannah Maloche, Ellie Thuman, and she fit kind of right into that niche. And it was just so easy for so many people to go gravitate towards that content because there were so many of them coming up at the same time. Yeah. Since the college admission scandal, she's been honestly extremely low key besides the fact that she's dating one of the most famous people ever right now. Totally. Like he didn't go to any of her like Dancing with the Stars performances or anything. (laughs) Like, yeah, super weird that they don't hang out like publicly, but they're always seen on like like walking his dog and stuff like that yeah 
Yeah, but like we don't even see her in like Australia or like I don't know, I don't know. We don't get no. It's anything. just like which I think is probably it's good and bad. I mean, it's bad as a viewer because you want to see people do red carpet appearances together, do interviews together, but probably for Olivia after the entire college admission thing, her keeping a low profile is probably extremely important to her. And then with Jacob, I I don't know. I think sometimes celebrities just want to keep their lives as private as they can and just try to be normal. And I think that's what they've been doing. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. I can't imagine like what would dinner like Jacob going oh, yeah. to <laughs> like, the family's house for dinner. Like, oh my God. Like, I don't know. I would, I would be so weird about it. Like I just <laughs> could not do that. <laughs> Uh, it's also really weird. I was thinking about this when I was writing this episode outline that his girlfriend prior to Olivia Jade was Kaya Gerber, who now dates Austin Butler. They both played Elvis in recent films. And I feel like they are like interchangeable couples. Like someone, one of my patrons messaged me the other day and was like, they are like, you know, the same couple, but in like a different like time like, yeah <laughs> like time yeah. war or like i don't know like on a different planet or whatever they're the same people i'm like yeah that's really true it's so funny because there's you can't even write something that rich the fact I that know, it works out that way is so yeah. funny <laughs> yeah no seriously i wonder if like that would be like something that you would see on a tv show like i'm thinking about the one that bella thorne was in i feel like i was the only person to like actually watch it but she was like a up-and-coming actor it, okay fame it was called famous in love it ran from for i think one season in 2017 to 2018 was it on the cw oh two seasons and it's about her trying to make it as like a uh like a famous actor and she's like kind of dating one of her co-workers and stuff like that but like this seems like a plot line like pulled from that show yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay let's talk about kim kardashian and balenciaga so this news broke uh this week about how kim kardashian is now the new brand ambassador for balenciaga and i feel like everyone remembers when uh, they were canceled in late 2022 because they had a bunch of like inappropriate images and like references to like Satan and like BDSM and stuff like that with children in the pictures. And so um, I feel like with everything, they just kind of made like a slow comeback back into like the mainstream and like are hoping that everyone forgets about this because Kim was obviously a really big supporter of Balenciaga. I feel like her relationship with Kanye really influenced that, but she wore, you know, the black outfit with the black, like the ponytail with the black mask and stuff like that to the Met Gala, like that was Balenciaga. And then of course, everyone knows the pants shoes combo like the pants that are also shoes very balenciaga and she was like pretty quiet about working with them over the past year and a bit but she's like full force working as their brand ambassador now what do you think about this i am not shocked <laughs> yeah yeah fair. So, it's so yeah. hard because i really do like kim kardashian but then when she does stuff that is controversial that it it makes no sense to me honestly from a business decision they the kardashians are run like a machine and to continue to do business with balenciaga even though kim has been a face of theirs for many years it doesn't make sense for her to go back i also feel like her style has evolved past the pant shoe we're past that it's not 2019 anymore we can leave that in the past and that's okay it's been done. She's done it. And she has been working with other designers such as Dolce & Gabbana. There are so many other fashion houses out there that would love to have Kim Kardashian as a brand ambassador. And that's what I don't get. Like Kanye was her, I guess, introduction to fashion. And that is how she got all these contacts to begin with. But that was so many years ago to the point where now Kim Kardashian, if any 
brand had her as their brand ambassador and the face, it would create buzz and it would like make people interested in wanting to see what they had to offer. Yeah. So it just doesn't make sense to me from a business standpoint. No, that makes a lot of sense. Like, but then I was thinking, I was like, do you think she can't get a brand deal with like another fashion house? Like, cause I was thinking like, Oh, hey, maybe like Lueve or something like that. Like a yeah. brand that's having like a lot of success, like recent success, a lot of, I feel like people are saying like, this is like not up and coming. I wouldn't, say that but like fresh and new and just like having a moment but I was like I feel like they wouldn't want to work with her yeah I think it's it's a hard disconnect because she also fully did a show with D&G and collaborated on every single archival piece that they pulled so having a fashion house trust you that much and allow you to fully design a runway collection it makes me think that Especially, like she did it with D&G, she could do it with someone else, and they were willing to work with her a year ago. So I don't really know. And I, I felt like this was the writing on the wall when she was promoting the Balenciaga X Erwan fashion show um, in the fall, which was a ridiculous concept. Like the fact that a major fashion house was collaborating with a grocery store in Los Angeles, no matter how bougie, is embarrassing. And to be the face of that collaboration as one of the most famous people in the entire world is embarrassing. Yeah, no, like, I totally agree. Like, that is so cringe. But I'm just wondering, yeah, I wonder if it's, like, these brands that have kind of had public scandals like Dolce & Gabbana and Balenciaga, I wonder if those are the only ones that are interested in working with her? I don't, I have no Maybe. idea. I, I, it's just so hard because I think the tide switched so quickly. You don't really know where to go. So maybe for Kim, she's thinking she has a great relationship with Demna and she probably is thinking to herself, this will blow over by the time we kind of create a new campaign. But we've seen on the internet, especially with this Balenciaga thing, it kind of transcends the traditional idea of like a, quick internet cancellation because it involved children and that I think really is where people draw the line um especially when it comes to Kim publicly supporting them when she has very young children of her own and that's kind of the hard the harsh truth of it I guess because she should not be near that brand after what they did image wise totally that was the other thing that I was really surprised about because the family is I think the foundation of the Kardashians fame is that they can always fall back on like we're a family and our kids are the most important thing. And like our, you know, like the matriarch and like all of those types of foundational pieces to the Kardashian success is like at risk when you're working with Balenciaga and yeah. So it doesn't seem risky, but also the Kardashians use outrage like bait and like outrage headlines and stuff like that to stay relevant so I don't know so I see it in that sense but yeah it's so weird and then yeah the pants shoes like you were saying that they're like they're not cool anymore like I was watching the traders and Larsa Mm -hmm. was wearing them (laughs) and it's like that's the definition of like we're past this where it's like it's like a nobody tv show no offense love love it can't wait for season three like it's (laughs) it's so good but like it's like you know a d-list reality tv star is and it's like a a kardashian (laughs) cast off like so like and she's wearing the fucking full like onesie or whatever or not onesie like bodysuit like the full cap suit with the shoe like the pants suit everything yes yeah and then she was wearing like a big jacket over top because they i think they film in scotland yeah. So it's like that's over. Once you can you can tell when a trend is over when like people that are not in like the like people that aren't the trendsetters or, like the cool people are copying. Yeah. Like... <laughs> I, it just oh makes God. me so upset because Kim has really good natural style, I think. And yeah. I think she's doing a great job kind of separating herself from cuz the whole pants shoe was a Kanye thing and so yes, when they yeah. stopped being together she made like a very conscious effort to 
kind of straddled that line of not trying to destroy her relationship with Balenciaga at the time, but still kind of find her own personal style. And I think she has great style. And she has a million people around her that will fit her in any sort of garment that she could ever want. Mm -hmm. And I just think it makes no sense for her brand. It makes no sense for the family as a machine. And it makes no sense for her personal style-wise to continue doing this with Balenciaga. It makes no sense to me. Yeah, completely. It's so, I don't know, it's so random. It seems like like one step backward when she had, yeah. you know, like been moving forward and moving on. Um, but yeah, I totally, I agree with you about the Erwan event. And then she has been seen a few times also wearing Balenciaga. So like the soft launch of yeah. this like partnership was definitely coming. And I think that's one of my favorite things about covering pop culture news and stuff like that is like when you see the the PR seeds being laid yeah. and then you're like, oh my God, duh. Like that's why this person was doing that. It was so, so we would have like a softer response or they could test the waters or yeah, yeah like launch this this brand partnership so yeah i'm curious like what's happening at the the jenner kardashian headquarters right now like because i wonder if they thought the response was going to be different like you were saying a lot of brands and stuff that get canceled like just come back but yeah. this one has seemed to really like stick and so i wonder if they're like oh shit this was like not the response we thought was gonna like come from this I just don't, like, Kim is an apparel brand owner with Skims. And I I think right now Skims is doing one of the best marketing campaigns out of any apparel brand in the world. Absolutely. I think she is, she is so, her team is so smart with who they choose to put in their campaigns, how they choose to launch things. And I would assume as a brand owner who sits in, I would say, a little bit at least in kind of formulating these marketing campaigns, understanding that Skims would never in a million years do what Balenciaga did in that campaign. And I think she probably has a better idea than a lot of other people because she understands what it takes to launch a successful marketing campaign. And seeing how badly the public reacted to Balenciaga it was for a good reason. And yeah. she must know that. So I don't know. I think they probably took a gamble on it, just kind of hoping the typical internet cycle took full effect. And obviously nowadays, so many brands or creators or celebrities can be canceled, but they'll be back within a year or two. And I think they were probably just trying to follow that cycle, uh, assuming Balenciaga would be forgotten about for a long enough time to then come back and people be like what were we mad at them for in the first place and 100 that has not happened nor should totally. it in my opinion yeah totally like those images are like burned into my brain and yeah, yeah like it was messed up for sure like they i don't think they need to come back there's tons of other design houses and stuff that have like more ethical practices Possibly, I don't know. I I did a fashion house episode over on my Patreon last year, and like, <laughs> that, like <laughs> ethics not not leading. Well, in the that's the thing that's industry. hard is when you really dig into any of them, you're you're gonna find things that you do not want to hear, and then it's just Absolutely. the worst of the fashion house evils, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> I think the the last thing I'll say about this is that. I do kind of think that she, you know, she has spent the last like 10 years building herself up to be a fashion girly and like with the, you know, the best of the best sitting next to Anna Winter at the fashion shows and stuff like that. But I kind of think even though I don't think the Kardashians popularity has waned at all, I wouldn't say that they are like cool or like, mm -hmm. I like, I don't know. I just think like, maybe they they couldn't land a better bigger more trend like on trend like fashion label for her to be an ambassador for and they are so desperate to keep her in the you know high fashion world that maybe they just like took what they could get and this was 
this was it. But I just think like Skims is becoming, I feel like, the yeah, cool, a big really cool place to, to shop. 100%. So I was like, why don't you just double down on mm. like skim stuff? Like, why do you need to also work with Balenciaga? I don't know. Which skims could do really cool collaborations with like Mugler. I think that would be yeah. a perfect collaboration for skims. They just did a Swarovski crystal collaboration. So it's not that skims couldn't collaborate with a fashion house. And I think that would be way better for Kim than her being the face of a brand in general. Totally, one hundred percent. I don't know, but yeah. that's just my two cents. I'm. <laughs> yeah, I'm like. What do I know about you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> about the literally. fashion houses. <laughs> no, literally, I always talk about this as I'm sitting in like an old navy, like <laughs> yeah. sweater and like some fucking like pajama pants. <laughs> 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 like, yeah, it, the two don't match up. But like, yeah, I, I. I would just be interested, yeah, because you're totally right. Skims has done other collabs with Swaski. They did one with Fendi. I'm sure there's yep. many, like, they have their deals with the NBA and the Olympics. Like, there's just so many cool things that they are doing that I was just like, I don't know, why don't you just, like, double down? But they always had to to have their hand in, like, multiple pots at yeah. one time, and it's... I guess I, again another part of their like strategy or whatever. So who am I to who am I to say? <laughs> okay, let's talk about Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. I asked you what are you dying to talk about on this episode. This was what you told me. So I'm very excited because I'm actually not a Real Housewives girly, but of course I've been following this because I feel like it has, I think a lot of Bravo content like we saw this with scandal like a lot of bravo yep. content is like kind of going outside of just the network so if anyone doesn't know what recently happened it was season f the season four finale of real houses of salt lake city and monica garcia who is a new cast member this is her first season was revealed it was like a very like scooby-doo rip the mask off the <laughs> the bad guy um situation she was revealed to be behind a bravo instagram account called reality von Teese, uh which was created three years ago and it was dedicated to exposing info about jen shaw who everyone knows as the former cast member who is now in jail um next to like the theranos like elizabeth yeah, Elizabeth uh, Holmes. Holmes. <laughs> yeah, uh, because she had a wire fraud scheme that she was, you know, caught and charged for. And so I think the scandal was so interesting. So A, the, the Instagram account started as a Jen Shaw gossip account, but it definitely expanded to the other cast members. And then it was run by like multiple people. It was like this big operation again, three years ago, who knew that she was going to get cast on the show. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a few really interesting points, kind of greater takeaways from this scandal. And it's like, did Bravo know? Cause they claim the production team. I read an interview said that they didn't know. But, like, that's sus. And then it's, like, just the the strategy about, and I guess we haven't heard about this, but correct me if I'm wrong, because, again, following it from the periphery, just the strategy of having this account from three years ago and then ending up on the show is so, the chances of this stuff is, again, like, one in a million couldn't write a better, like, Gossip Girl, like, plot line it killed me let's start what are your thoughts on that and then we can get into like more of the finer the finer points i have so many thoughts about this because i love real housewives so much and i wasn't a huge fan of salt lake city um i tried watching season one i just wasn't a huge and i always followed along because i knew about the jen shaw of it all and i was kind of waiting for the castle to crumble in that aspect and i think my biggest problem of the show prior to the season was everyone kind of knew that something was happening with Jen and no one really was putting it all out there in terms of trying to kind of film, get it on camera that she was guilty of doing something wrong. 
and people stood by her. She was a terrible person on the show. She added a lot of drama. She was a very good reality TV villain, and I really liked her in season one for that part. But as the show kept going on and things kept go- getting a little bit shadier, she was getting investigated, people weren't really putting it all out there. And my favorite Real Housewives seasons are when these women come to work and they just decide to put all of it out there and they make each other work. And this season is exactly what they did. Every single cast member clocked in um, and they were ready to to like provide a season of television that I would say is top five housewife season of all time. Yeah, like Jennifer Lawrence is talking about it on yes. the red carpet. There was a congressman who quoted Heather in like a speech against Trump. Like it is yeah. <laughs> blown up. And like, we're, obviously we're talking about the the receipts proof timeline screenshots like it is so wild to me that this blew up so do you think the producers knew she was running this or had any involvement because she worked for jen shaw so um and she was a witness in the trial so obviously there is information that she was like privy to like she said she like knew a bit about what happened and stuff like that yeah do you think that they knew that she was behind this account i think the producers knew something monica was quote unquote jen's assistant or yeah assistant but then was also jen's friend um and i don't really know who in real life would be friends with jen shaw um <laughs> Brutal, without, but yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. without wanting something out of it and from what i've seen it seems like monica became friends with jen in the first place to kind of be in this world whether or not she was going to get on the show as a main cast member maybe just trying to break into the higher society in salt lake city with the end goal of hoping to be on the show but if not she could still make a few cameos be ingrained with some of these ladies and kind of make a name for herself in Salt Lake City. I think that the producers knew something was up in general with Monica. I don't know if they knew the extent of this account. I do not think any of the ladies knew about it prior. Oh, that is just so crazy. Okay, my question for you also is like, how and why did it blow up when they were on that trip? that just happened to also be like filming the season finale. Okay. So it's kind, it kind of was a perfect storm because right around that time, um, Heather and um, Meredith and Monica and Angie were kind of, there were some mixed conflicts going on because Meredith and Monica were kind of ganging up on Angie and they were talking Say Meredith and Monica made it seem like someone was sending DMs, fake or real from like a burner account to kind of spill some tea on Angie that they were going to bring up on camera in Bermuda, which ended up happening. And then when Heather started hearing these details, like these rumblings of an Instagram account kind of talking about these ladies and sending DMs and she kind of thought of something weird that was happening. She owns a business called Beauty Lab and Laser in Salt Lake City. And around that same time, she was investigating getting, well, first she was going to get Monica a gift card for her birthday and they were going to to Bermuda for Monica's birthday. And so around the time where she was hearing that, she was also going to Beauty Lab and Laser to get Monica a gift card. When they looked her name up in the system, she had had three different accounts, one of them with a balance of like two grand remaining on it. So Heather then realized that Monica was kind of a con and then was also hearing about the DM. So she was kind of putting these pieces together in her head while they were on the trip in Bermuda and then got confirmation because she had her people like start digging into this more because she started hearing these different things like that Monica had an outstanding bill that someone was sending burner DMs to Meredith about Angie sending tax documents and stuff. And once someone looked into it, they realized that she was behind Reality Von Tees, which is why they had that last dinner where, I mean, someone has to run Heather Gay a gigantic check for the way she delivered that because, I mean, that, like, 
She had one shot and she delivered it Killed flawlessly. It. And it will be forever quoted in Real Housewives history. And it was perfect the way that she did it. Um, but yeah, I just think it was kind of a perfect storm of events because all season it was Meredith and Angie were coming to a head and people were getting mad at Meredith, but Meredith was kind of opening up saying, well, Monica's also getting these DMs. And that's when Heather's kind of red light started going, thinking this woman could be a con artist and be playing all of us. So again, it was the perfect storm. I think it was kind of a mix of drama that was already happening and stuff that came to a head in Bermuda because it was the final cast trip. And in it, Meredith also finds out that Monica was there when something was stolen from her store. So that was another part of it too. Interesting. And then they had a mutual hairdresser, right? Heather and Monica? Monica's friend, Tanisha, was Heather's hairdresser. And that was, I think, one of the people that confirmed to Heather that Monica was behind Reality Von Tees, even though Tanisha is a co-owner of the account as well. Yeah, so like kind of told on herself, but like, yeah, yeah. But she was able to send Heather messages that Monica had sent her, like voice memos, texts, all this stuff, proving that Monica was behind the account so Heather could do that reveal on camera and feel good about it because she had proof. She had all of everything that she needed in order to nail Monica down in that moment. So that way Monica had no rebuttal. Ugh, that's like so thrilling. Like, yes, it reminds me of when people are like playing survivor and stuff like that. And they know like who they're voting for and they're going to like pull off this big blind yep. side. And like, it's just so exciting. And I feel like Heather must've been just riding a high. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my God. And you know what? She needed it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, with the black eye and everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing like that, I, I think the, the big takeaway is, yeah, it's like how much does production know? Cause I'm always curious about that. And then how did she, yeah. How did she get cast? But like the, the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about is like how Dumois and blind items and, these T accounts have impacted uh, reality TV because obviously I think that this is now like the biggest example of this, but yeah. in winter house, there was a storyline about which you don't watch winter house. Cause you haven't watched summer house yet. I must say. Yeah. No, yes, okay. <laughs> I haven't seen winter house. Well, when you, you can watch it, some of the seasons concurrent with Summer House because it's like, oh, okay. ca- yes, like cast. It's overlap, right? Yes, like they'll, yes, yeah. yes. So like you can do some of them interspersed. But there was a storyline this past season where Dumois had posted about this guy and girl hooking up, like one of the Summer House cast members and one of the Below Deck cast members were hooking up in Winter House and like flirting stuff like that and the girlfriend of the cast member uh wasn't on the show but was coming to visit for one of the weekends to film and she came in hot because she was like well I heard all of these Dumois rumors and so I was obviously like like curious and like upset and stuff like that and then there was other and I can't remember what it was but my listeners hopefully can point it out to me in Summer House there was other storylines that Dumois had influenced. And I know that this isn't Dumois, but it is like a tea spill account, which Bravo has like a million. And I, I do f- yeah. feel like I follow most of them. Mm-hmm. And they all have like tens of thousands to like hundreds of thousands of followers. And they impact the show. It's wild. Yeah. I think it kind of opens a bigger conversation about casting in general because we're past the era of any reality show specifically bravo where they can cast someone who doesn't know that the show already exists and can't look up every single detail about an existing show and i would say reality von Tees, it's hard because jen shaw was it was a felon on television that no one did anything to really stop or call her out on tv at all and in beverly hills when erica was being accused of being shady and conspiring with tom They brought it up on camera every single episode and they dragged Erica for an entire season or two seasons over this Tom stuff. So it was just 
weird seeing on Salt Lake City, no one really tried to tell Jen that she wasn't innocent or insinuate that in any sense. And I think the people closest to Jen knew everything that was going on, Monica being one of them. And do I think that having a T account to put someone in jail who rightfully should be in jail is the worst thing in the world? No. Um, but I understand that obviously all of these ladies were so closely related to Jen that they caught strays in all of it. Yeah. Um, because they were supporting her, especially Heather. Yeah. And so, but looking at it from the other side, I would never, if I was an existing cast member, I would never film with Monica again, because even though her goal wasn't to destroy me as an individual, it was using someone's secrets against them. And once you know someone is capable of doing that, then it's hard to film a reality show with them because you have no idea what's going to happen when they start talking to the press during the season or taking your secrets and using them against you, not on the show, but just in life. 100%. Um, so I understand why the women would not film with Monica. I don't think Reality Von Tees was an awful idea in the first place. I wish the other ladies maybe didn't catch strays from it because some of them really didn't deserve it. But I'm glad that it kind of all came out in the way that it did because it made one of the best episodes of television ever. <laughs> totally. And like the other piece of this that's so interesting is like, do you know like blind items? Like obviously like yeah, Dumois, yeah. I feel like previous to like you know maybe 2020 or whatever I feel like there was like maybe some more validity to them because it was like less mainstream it was more this like not small community but like tight knit like it stayed in the community and stuff like that and then with Dumois it just like really blew up and I think that the thing is interesting is because blind item accounts will be like yeah someone like a hairdresser yep. like in the like told me this or like a door person or a makeup artist or an assistant or whatever and so there was like these sources but like it's so wild to think that this was a cast member yeah and that probably means that a lot of the stuff I feel like has some truth and like validity to it in a way that we probably have never seen yeah. Like you have to take a lot of the shit that like Dumois and stuff post with a grain of salt. But like, I feel like a lot of this, it's like, no, this person knows them in real life and like is yeah. probably, like getting more accurate information than like, you know, all the other kind of like blind item accounts. So it's so interesting to me. Yeah, it's it's such a weird kind of thing to see play out on reality television. The fact that someone who could record Jen Shaw in her home without having any cameras, voice recordings, actual video recordings, and posting them on the internet and then gets cast on the show that Jen was on. I mean, again, I think Monica really did want to be on the show from the beginning. I think that she did kind of make that clear a little bit um, on the reunion, even though she didn't come out and say it, like the way that she has worded things. And someone said, I think Heather brought up a receipt of Tanisha basically saying that she wanted to kim kardashian because kim started out as paris's assistant and then yeah. obviously oh, as the kim kardashian we know today so again a lot of the stuff that she insinuated made it seem like she wanted to be on this show and i don't think she was going to use reality von Tees to do it but i think once producers put the pieces together that she was so close to jen she was a witness in her trial she was excommunicated from the mormon church for having an affair with her brother-in-law like all of these things are like check, 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 perfect reality TV candidate. And we will not talk about, tell any of the cast members about the fact that she is a part runner of this account and we will use it as our finale storyline. And I think that is perfect. Like, again, you couldn't write something that good. No, <laughs> you, no you truly couldn't. They tried in Gossip Girl and stuff like yeah. that. And it's, it's not as good. Like... No, absolutely. It's it's so brilliant. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's really good. It's actually just like Scandaval also. Like, I had never watched Vanderpump Rules. I am currently doing a free watch. I'm on season six. But, again, like, I, I kind of had interest, and I knew on the periphery. Same with Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. Like, I think I watched maybe the premiere, but, like, yeah. I wasn't super interesting, interested, and I am, like, going to go back once I finish my Vanderpump 
watch, I'm going to go and watch the four seasons of this show just just to fully understand this finale, just like how I did with you know season ten of Vanderpump. Yeah, it's Wild. so interesting. I just I don't know. I think season four of Salt Lake will be one of the best house. It was such a good season up until the finale, and then the finale really like cemented it as one of my favorite Real Housewives seasons ever. Totally. No notes, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's talk about Hannah Burner before we wrap up the episode. Uh, so Hannah Burner is a, a cast member of the aforementioned Summer House. She was, I think, on seasons three, four, five. Uh, and then I think she was not fired, but like wasn't brought on when they like um, send out new contracts for the new season. She had kind of a rough, rough go of, go of it. Um, she was cast with Paige DeSorbo and they host a podcast called Giggly Squad. I've talked about it on the show. And she just, she's a stand-up comedian. And she just, uh, we just heard today. So again, last week when you're listening that, to this, that her comedy set is becoming a Netflix special. This is fucking huge like this is huge news yeah i i will say before this entire we go into the comedy special the fact that she was able to transition from being on reality tv to being a comedian without i would say 75 percent of her fan base knowing that she was ever on summer house is insane you, like especially with the internet today you can't live anything down but people know hannah burner from tiktok and her comedy and giggly squad now they do not know her from Summer House, which I think is a, a terrific rebrand because I don't. It's so hard to do now to fully 100%. like change niches like that. Yeah, the the TLDR is that she had a big falling out with this couple, Kyle and Amanda, and Kyle is kind of the he like basically created the show. I don't, I don't know if it was his idea that he pitched to Bravo, but he is kind of the glue that holds the group together. It has always centered around him, like, you know, quote unquote, renting a summer house in the Hamptons and inviting his group of friends to share, like do a share house together. And um, I think he has a lot of uh, sway and a lot of power within the Summer House franchise. Who gets cast, who, you know, doesn't get invited back, etc. I think he dictates a lot of the stuff that happens. He has an alcohol brand that is the, like, primary drink of the show that just gets... He pays for the booze for the show, but, like, it gets all of that free not free, but like cheap advertisement. Like he is just, you know, the, the kingmaker of summer house. And he had a really big fight in the COVID season of summer house with Hannah burner. And she was kind of like, yeah, like excommunicated. And I think when people look back on her time on the show, it's more fondly in hindsight than it was mm -hmm. like, she was absolutely ripped apart, like probably like myself included at the <laughs> time. Um, but I feel like rewatching it and stuff like that, there was a lot more at play than, yeah, just hindsight's twenty twenty. I feel like a lot of people look back on um, her time like a lot clearer now. And Kyle even said this year at BravoCon that he wouldn't mind her coming back to the show. Oh yeah, I remember seeing that. Yeah, but the the interesting part of this is that everyone was like okay you fucked up like you know the biggest break of your life like this is it um and she has completely pivoted she's done so well I think part of that is that she is really good friends with Alex Cooper and they mm -hmm. did a bunch of collabs on Caller Daddy and uh Burning in Hell which is Hannah's solo podcast where she like interviews people and then um so I think that has helped and then Kickly Squad has which is her and Paige's podcast as I said such a reverent like a reverence like such a big following and they rarely talk about the show that they were both on together so it's it's very very interesting 
uh, to see her break out into like such a successful comedian. We need more women in comedy. I totally agree. And I think she's done a really good job of kind of becoming a mainstream comic to the point where I would say maybe a year ago, Netflix would have never considered her to be someone to give a special to. But she has created this brand for herself where she has a very unique, I saw her stand-up show a couple weeks ago, and I think it's going to be the one that's getting taped for Netflix. And she has a very unique lane, and she was hilarious. If you, honestly, if anyone listening has the opportunity to go see her at a comedy club, she's doing a tour right now. I paid maybe $30 for my ticket and I was crying laughing. She was so funny. Yeah, I have to say, so I used to actually pretty regularly listen to, uh, listen to burning the head out in hell because, um, I liked her like mental health Mm -hmm. discussion with her guests and stuff like that. And I also listened to giggly squad quite regularly and then kind of just fell off. I'm like, I should like go back and like, listen to those podcasts. Honestly, I think the Hannah burner one, like this, her solo pod, because it has that. And I don't know if it still has like those noises. Cause it's like burning. Oh, in hell. Yes, like I the see, sa- yeah. satanic, <laughs> like, like laughing noises is like, sometimes I'd listen to it when I was like falling asleep or something like that. And like literally like jump scare because <laughs> <laughs> that would happen. I was like, I just can't do this. But yeah, I think also she had a, a few missteps with like, maybe not copying jokes, but like being heavily inspired by, yeah. Um, some internet content but I feel like that was again like maybe like two three years ago I don't think she's had any really like scandals since then I think she's also had a little bit of a glow up which not saying that she needed one at all or anything like that but like she definitely like found a stylist yes I dyed her hair a different agree. color yeah. like, 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 like nailed the makeup routine like got the skincare down like all of that and yeah, she's just been killing it. So I, I do kind of want to revisit some of her her content. But I, I don't know. I would have been so stressed out if I, you know, quote unquote, ruined the, you know, biggest opportunity of my life. So I'm just I am really glad that she's like, like fell on her feet and like has a was able to, um, I don't know, thrive in, in really tough like circumstances. Yeah, I'm so happy for her. I feel like she totally deserves this. And in terms of like the internet um, copying jokes thing, I think I remember that a couple of years back. Mm-hmm. But I feel like it's so hard to, first of all, not do that. And also, I've seen a couple other comedians in the last, I would say, six to eight months get called out for copying jokes from other comedians or just fully lying in their stand-up routines. Mm-hmm. Um So, again, like, I just think now it's so hard because there are so many internet comedians that stand-up comics, I think, take inspiration and sometimes a little bit too much. But Totally, totally. (laughs) And it's kind of like the Olivia Rodrigo stuff where it's like, is it stolen or is it, like, heavily inspired? Yes, that's such a good example. Uh, Yeah, like... It's really hard, I feel like, to differentiate. And, like, I feel like a lot of people do it unknowingly. Like, yeah. um, what is your own and what you've consumed? Because we're always on our fucking phones. And, like, yeah. I feel like sometimes stuff doesn't even, like, register really in our brains anymore. Yep. Until you're, like, yeah, using it in your stand-up routine or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, Yeah, I- I'm excited to see where this goes. I- I'm definitely going to watch the the stand-up special so yeah we'll see we'll see um what's next for hannah okay let's wrap up uh with our two segments uh petty weight champion of the week this is the part of the show where our guest is going to nominate a petty weight champion of the week someone in the media who did something petty and it was iconic holden who are you nominating this week i am nominating renee rapp And this is not a bad thing. I want to tell everyone (laughs) that this is not bad. She's being petty in the best way possible because if you have seen her throughout her press tour for Mean Girls, she is using every single interview to air out grievances with random people (laughs) that she's encountered in the industry. Yes. Yes. Oh, my God. That's so (laughs) funny. Like, what was the one that was about, like, a random person in school that, like, 
<laughs> like, like, I can't even keep track at this point. I know yeah. she went on that rant about the bus driving company, that guy named Buddy. <laughs> Yes, it was rude yes. to her friend Priscilla and her mom, and she just <laughs> went on a gigantic tangent in an Entertainment Tonight interview to say that he is the worst person in the world. And her co-stars were just sitting there laughing, basically being like, I can't control this girl, which, thank God, because the entertainment world and Hollywood and celebrities in general need more people like Renee Rapp. Everyone is so polished these days to the point where they don't want to make any sort of misstep. And I just want to get back to the idea that celebrities can be messy and not be burned at the stake for it. Yeah, 100%. Like, if you're not, like, harming someone or, like, um, being disrespectful and stuff like that, it's so nice to see people let loose a little bit. Like, I'm like, why would anyone listen to a late night interview and stuff like that when it's just, like, okay, we're going to ask our, like, four canned questions. Yeah. And you'll respond your four canned answers. Like, like that's, I just... Yeah, unless, everything like, is screened, like, by their screened. teams. And they, yeah. Yeah, 100%. And it's, like, it's not interesting. And you don't learn anything from it. And I will only see it if it goes, like, super viral. Yeah. And I love that I feel like... I know who Renee is and what she's all about and stuff like that. It makes me fear that one day people will turn on her a la Jennifer Lawrence or like. Anne Hathaway. Anne Hathaway. Just like I feel like the para- parasocial relationship is strong with Renee. Yeah. That, um, I feel like she could get like not canceled because I think she's like a good person and stuff like that. But like kind of just like disliked for no reason yeah and that's like the sad part about the internet because it just goes in waves and no one can really control it like once the public kind of decides to turn on you then they do and you just kind of have to ride it out until they don't anymore which is such a harsh truth of being someone in the spotlight um but i have seen so many tiktoks of people being worried that you know renee is going to experience this but i think the difference now between between this and specifically the Jennifer Lawrence thing is there was not that kind of like speculation that it was going to happen. I think one day it was just Jennifer Lawrence is out and she will be for a couple years. And everyone just decided to get on that bandwagon. But with someone like Renee now who has this fan base, but also people who are cognizant of the way the internet works and the way that it kind of ebbs and flows, I don't think it will be as drastic. I'm sure it'll go down a little bit because she's just riding such a high right now but she's just such a likable personality that i feel like it it won't last for long 100 yeah i know which is like so gross totally and i feel like also we've like there's been so many think pieces and like commentary videos and stuff like that and internet essays about the anne hathaways and the jennifer lawrences and stuff like that and i do think that maybe as a society we've maybe not learned better but like maybe are more aware of it so maybe yeah yeah like won't happen but yeah I just it's been so refreshing to see this type of content like it's how I would want to show up on red carpets and stuff like that yeah and she's been so good like uh especially when well on her birthday when she tripped and fell with a bottle of champagne and then page six posted about it but before the page six article could even come out she posted a photo on instagram being like scrape my knee before i even got drunk and it's just doing stuff like that that is so funny and so i don't want to say camp but like it kind of is because it's i would say a lost art in being so candid in an interview where you feel comfortable enough to kind of do whatever and there was a moment too where she was on watch what happens live last week Mm -hmm. and she made a joke that she was ageist Mm -hmm. and I think that's hard because like with her humor someone who knows her and then the explanation afterwards her being like there were I said that because there were so many older people especially on Broadway and in Hollywood that have taken advantage of me and said like spoken down to me because I'm younger that it's made me actually not look towards older people as people of authority that should be respected automatically because 
they are just naturally older than me. So once you kind of hear that, if you didn't watch the whole interview or didn't know her, I think that it's kind of an example of where it, it can be taken out of context. And it, or if you don't know her and you don't understand her humor, then that can be taken as very blunt and come off as serious. So I don't know. I think that was a good example of seeing how people who don't really know her or didn't watch the entire interview kind of can see what she's saying and take it the way they want to interpret it and start to kind of sway public opinion. Absolutely. Especially because the people that she was sitting with were older people. So yeah, I feel like we're older were, people, yeah. Yeah, so Andy was like, what do you, like, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Which is <laughs> like, it's like, okay, um, but... I completely agree because like me and my friends laugh all the time that we're ageist like (laughs) like and not like not like again not in the way that like Renee that people thought Renee were talking about but like like you know we talk about like oh you like fucked up our housing market and stuff like that or you like Drain social security. Yeah, yeah. Or it's like, you're a bigot. Like, why would I give a fuck about what you have to say? So, like, I, uh, yeah, I I totally get her humor, but it's like those that get it, get it. And then those that don't, just like, yeah. really don't. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm. she's actually another one. Like, a Hannah Burner, not that she got let go, but she decided to leave Sex Lives of College Girls. And I said this on the pod, but I was really nervous because – you know, you could leave, like, I always use One Direction as an example. You could leave the band and be the, like, the Zane, Or you could be the Harry Styles. Yeah. Or the Louis. That might be a, even a better, <laughs> <laughs> like, um, example. But, like, I, you're nervous when, you know, the the thing that made you famous or whatever is, like, taken away from you. Or you choose not to um, continue it. When she could have totally just written out that, like... Yeah. like those I don't know probably it probably would have been like a five or four or five season show or whatever she could could have just done that but she took this risk and it seems like it's paying off so happy yeah I think that she's doing a great job and I don't want the Mean Girls press tour to stop personally yeah I know (laughs) I know have you seen the movie yes and that is kind of what I wanted to talk about in our next segment so I want to hold my thoughts Okay. Okay. I love that. Okay. So um, let's move on to this week in petty. This is the part of the show where our guest is going to share something that they are petty about in their real lives. Uh, Holden, what are you petty about? I am petty about people walking out of Mean Girls because they didn't know it was a musical. Every single time I see a TikTok of a group of people getting up and walking out of the theater the second and Gory Rice opens her mouth to sing the first note of the movie. I'm like, sit back down because you're going to want to watch this. Yes. uh, (laughs) This is my maybe hot take. I think that people are now faking that. Yeah. And I, the thing that's so hard is, again, you never know what's real and what's fake, but they purposefully did not market it as a musical on purpose. So I think maybe the first couple of showings in different areas, I can totally believe that groups of people got up and left because they were expecting a movie that was, Mean Girls in 2024. And that's just not what it is. But that's okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, but the other part is it's like also why did you think that? Because Yeah, yes. <laughs> like because if you learned anything, it was like it is the Broadway musical being made into a movie. That's what I'm so confused about that the fucking music note in the yes. main, like the the billing like it does not make sense to me at all. Like, how could you know about the movie enough to go that you don't know that it's a musical? Yes, that's, it's just so hard for me because even if you didn't know, why not stay? You already paid. Yeah. And yeah. I, I really enjoyed it because I love musicals. And I think if you just go into it with an open mind and not expect it to be the Mean Girls that you know and love, then you will have an amazing viewing experience. I have not heard of someone disliking this movie going in with an open mind. When yeah. you expect it to be too similar, then obviously you're going to be disappointed because it's not the same movie. It's not the same cast. It's not the same people you grew up with. It's a totally different movie though. And when you look at it from a different lens, I hate to use this word again, but it really, it is camp. And yeah, totally. When you have people 
that are able to do it so well. Renee did it on Broadway. She was Regina on Broadway. When you have someone like that doing the movie version, you're going to want to watch it. It is so good. Yeah. I'm so excited because I was supposed to see it last Thursday, but I got snowed out. So um, I'm seeing it this coming Thursday and I can't wait. Like I, I'm so excited. Like we talked about with Lindsay. Yes. Like it's, still quoted to this day like it it has just really impacted like cinema and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and um yeah I I can't wait for it to get its dues and like I feel like we've had success with like Dear Evan Hansen and like for some reason I can't think of like any other Broadway shows to to like to movies but like I'm sure that this could open the door for like Maybe the Legally Blonde one or... Yes. Oh, Wicked. Wicked is like... Oh my God, I'm so I'm excited s- for Wicked. You have no idea. I think about it literally every day. No, me too. And apparently they just made a TikTok account. So yes, I feel like we're going to get... Yeah, we're going to get a trailer like really soon. But yeah, like there's going to be all of these really cool, I, I think, opportunities. We Even like just how they taped Hamilton and like put it on Disney plus and stuff like that like there, I feel like it's just a new way to bring Broadway which is a pretty like exclusive audience like you either have to be in New York or you have to you know be available when they come to your city if they come yep. to your city at all um, if you don't live in a major city you're like you're screwed and you have to have like a lot of money or not a lot of money but yeah. like it's a, a pricey ticket and uh yeah, like it really is democratizing a lot of these like musical, like not to get too into the weeds of it. It's, it's like, sometimes it's really not that serious, but like it, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm very excited. So yeah, it's so annoying that people are saying that. I think now they're just doing it for like the clout or whatever, but I just also can't imagine going to see a movie that I wasn't like guaranteed to like stay to the end. Yeah. And you already paid for your ticket too. You already blocked out that time in your calendar. You paid for it. Just day you probably already bought a drink snack like (laughs) no 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 harm no foul at that point and again they keep it they have all of your favorite quotes from the original movie it literally has every single big quote from the original mean girls is in the musical and they make sure that it's known and it's very referential it's self-referential it references current pop culture they do a, a funny job kind of um talking about Thank you, next, because the Ariana Grande music video oh does uh, yeah. obviously play on the original movie. And then in the remake, they do a nod to Ariana, which, again, I just love when things can be self-referential, but also they can reference pop culture. That's so cool. I haven't heard that yet. I'm so fucking excited. I, I'm so thrilled. But yeah, totally um, agree with you that, yeah, it doesn't... like. Okay, so, like, it it doesn't need to ruin your life if you find out that there's, like, seven (laughs) songs or whatever. It's not even a lot of songs. And also, like, maybe marketing for musicals will change because I know then people were like, well, they did this for Wonka, too. So, like, maybe maybe they'll be more clear about music, musical movies in the future i don't know who knows uh, who knows i mean i'm everything's always changing if they market it as a musical people are going to be like why would they do that so you're you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't so it just is what it is but i will say it'll be really interesting to see how they do wicked and the new joker movie with lady gaga because both are musicals and both have extremely talented it girl pop stars as the main characters mm-hmm. so i think for those movies they're going to heavily play into the fact that those people will be singing throughout. Absolutely. And like, I feel like also with the success of Mean Girls, it's done well at the box office, despite some of the, again, naysayers on TikTok. Um, Maybe this is like a musical movie renaissance and maybe we'll see a lot more. Like, I would be happy. I like, I'm not- I would love that. I love a musical. (laughs) Me too. Like, I'm not like a diehard. Like, I can't quote like all of the musical stuff. Like, I I don't watch the Tonys or like whatever. But like, I I like a good, I like a good musical. (laughs) Yes. And everyone loves Mamma Mia and Mamma Mia is a musical. So 
yes. if you can get and if you can get behind Mamma Mia, then you should just give some of these other musicals a shot. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah, totally. Okay, well then this was super fun. Where can the listeners find you and anything else you want to plug? Find me on TikTok. My username is Holden Smith962 and Instagram. My username is underscore Holden Smith. Thank you so much for having me. I always have the best time. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad. Yeah, I could literally talk to you forever. So <laughs> I know. <same. laughs> yeah, you'll have to come on again. <laughs> okay. And there you have it. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you to Holden for joining me on today's episode. If you want more content, join me on Patreon. Last week, I talked about Vanderpump Rules Season 5, Episodes 16 and 17, where it's Katie and Schwartz's joint bachelor-bachelorette parties. And I dared to say a brave but true statement that it was the best two episodes of reality TV that I've ever watched. And I had the lovely Emily Rose come and chat with me about both episodes. I want to give a shout out to Marissa and Elizabeth for being awesome patrons. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for supporting RTBP in this way. The encouragement really keeps me going and like your belief in me and my work is really, really, really kind. If after all of that, you are not sick of me, I am also discussing A Court of Mist and Fury parts one and two over on my other podcast, Ready to Be Romance, super fun book. I cover it with one of my BFFs, Megan, so you can always check that out. And before you go, I want to share one of my other favorite podcasts, Two Cents Critic. I've been on five times. I was just on talking about a holly jolly ever after. But if you are into discussions and reviews about books, movies, and TV, it will be right up your alley. Check out Two Cents Critic, the podcast where host Arthur Howell, along with the help of plenty of special guests, including myself, take the time to break down a whole range of media. You want to hear about rom-com books like The Spanish Love Deception by Elena Armas, which I also covered with Arthur, or anime series like Death Note, an action movie classic like Die Hard, while covering on those things and more can be found on two cents critic so come on and tune in on all podcast platforms and check out arthur's twitter and instagram at two underscore cents critic new episodes every wednesday friends if you're still listening mwah, thank you so so much i hope you are all safe and healthy out there as always i'm your host tori and i'm ready to be petty see you soon bye